Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo. It's such an honor to be with you today and we so appreciate you joining us. So for those who don't know, Jetsuna, Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo was born Diane Perry in England in 1943. Inspired by Buddhism from a young age, she traveled to India in 1964 and was ordained as one of the first Western Tibetan Buddhist nuns by His Holiness the 16th Karmapa and training with the 8th Kamchul Rinpoche. She subsequently undertook a strict 12-year meditation retreat in a remote Himalayan cave. Returning from retreat in 1988, she began teaching internationally at the request of her late teacher. In the decade that followed, honoring his wish to establish a nunnery, she founded the Dongyu Gatsal Ling, which now houses over 100 nuns. Recognized for her spiritual accomplishments, she received the title of Jetsuma, Venerable Master, from the Drukpa Kagyu Head in 2008, and continues working to promote female monasticism in Buddhism. Her 1998 biography, Cave in the Snow by Vicki McKenzie, is a must read. And Venerable, we're just so grateful to have you take the time to be with all, us today. Thank you so much. So we've listened to many of the interviews you've given, and I'm sure you've been uh, approached with almost every question one can think of. But one I wanted to begin with um, is uh, in some of the interviews you've given, you've spoken about Rigpa, the primordial awareness, bodhicitta, and of peeling the onion, so to speak, down to the most refined levels of awareness. And I'm curious, how do you advise practitioners to approach those concepts without uh, reifying them into a new sense of, of self? And, and how do you work with or advise people to conceive of and work with those more refined states of consciousness in the mind? Oh, that's a huge question to get started on. Nothing like <laughs> straight I to the, straight, straight in. in. <laughs> 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 um, well, I, I think we should, um, you know, pay heed to what the Buddha said, that we all have monkey minds, mad monkey minds. And so the first step is to start to tame the monkey. Because even if we should have some you know, breakthrough experience, which some people do, even without practicing, like even in childhood, of recognizing the ultimate nature of the mind, what can you do with it? if you're a mad monkey. And <laughs> so the first thing is to calm the mind and to start to train the mind. By training the mind, we transform the mind. And that transformed mind has the opportunity to transcend the ordinary conceptual, dualistic, egotistic um, level of our consciousness. So uh, to my mind, even though in the Tibetan tradition, at least in the Nyingma and Kaju tradition, it's considered to, that the first thing is to get that initial glimpse. Like if you consider our mind like clouds, then in the monsoon here, thick clouds, month after month, or when you look in the sky, all you see are clouds. And so you think the sky is clouds. But then if we look, keep looking, maybe the clouds will split, come apart for a moment, and then we see the sky. And we realize we are not the clouds, that there is this level of pure consciousness which interconnects us because it's not dualistic, instead of separating us as our dualistic mind does. But the clouds close up again, right? So. The important thing, therefore, is to have a stable mind, a mind which is well... You know, shamatha practice is very important because it clears the mind, it makes the mind one-pointed, it develops our ability to be aware so that the mind is workable, is, is you know, the, is, we can use it. It's, it's instead of 
you know, being the main obstacle for our practice, it became, comes the practice. And so this is very useful. If our mind is already stable and clear and well-directed, then when we do get these glimpses of the pure nature of the mind, we actually can begin to have more frequent glimpses and also gradually, gradually, gradually to um, inter interconnect that with our whole life, including not just our waking time, but also uh, during sleep. I mean, a Buddha is completely awake and in a state of rikpa his whole life. That's why he's a Buddha. And even advanced masters would normally say, we're like you, we're just practicing, and would never claim that they are totally, absolutely enlightened. I've never heard any Lama claim to be enlightened. They just say, we're like you, we're, you know, something along on the path. I mean, they're a few thousand miles ahead, <laughs> but, they're, but they see themselves still as, as practitioners. Thank you, Venerable. And I've heard you speak about the, the practice as a sort of like an analogy of the monastery and how people do get fixated on the roof and the ornamentation, but the importance of digging the foundations and how we need to spend years doing that. And for um, the a lay person who has duties, family, a job, who you know, maybe does have a glimpse of this luminescence or at least some path forward, but doesn't know how to bring their life in line with it completely or, or to cultivate that stable mind in the midst of modernity, what, what guidance would you give for them? Well, I mean, I really feel it's very important that we should not make a division between when we're doing formal sitting or reading a Dharma text or listening to a Dharma talk, that is Dharma. And the rest of our day, dealing with family, dealing with our workplace, dealing with the neighbors, dealing with life, that is worldly activity and therefore an obstacle to our Dharma practice. If we think like that, then really there's no hope to really transform the mind. And so what we need is to change our attitude and recognize that our daily life is our Dharma practice. One way we can do that, apart from cultivating as much mindfulness and awareness as we possibly can during our day, and also opening our heart to be more kind under all circumstances, is to recognize um, that the, the Dharma path is not just about meditation. I mean, you have the Noble Eightfold Path, you have the Paramita, all of these meditations, just one part. There are all these other qualities, you know, um, in the Paramita, for example, apart from ethics, basic ethics, which are extremely important, non-harming in all our conduct. Uh, there's also generosity, patience, a huge, useful, quality to cultivate, and as well as, you know, enthusiasm, you know, enthusiastic effort, and just looking on every, everything which we are doing as the opportunity to cultivate the qualities of the heart, and not seeing even difficulties as an obstacle, but seeing them as an opportunity for practice then our whole life becomes, you know, the means on the way. I mean, it's all, it's the path. When I first became Buddhist, <coughs> one of my deepest gratitude to the Buddha was the fact that he showed a path. He didn't just say, well, this is how it is, get there. Um, he showed a very clear path with all the techniques and methods for helping us to, to walk along in, in a meaningful manner. So this is the important thing, to recognize that, you know, daily life is the practice. Yeah. Venerable, that's fantastic advice. Um, and just reorienting our attention from things which 
you know, might be very, uh, uh, you know, very bright and, you know, people are hear about Rigpa and, and you want it and you want it all the time. And, but coming back to practices in your most recent book, I believe the heroic art, I mean, just all your teachings on the 37 uh, practices of a Bodhisattva Two, well, many of them really stuck out for me. Um, two, which relate to what you've been talking about, are actually numbers two and three, which are um, number two, to abandon my native land is the practice of a bodhisattva. And number three, to rely on solitude is a practice of the bodhisattva. So how does one do those things without kind of reifying the act of separation and retreat and solitude? and solitude as being the practice versus all these other aspects of daily life, like staying in one, one's own homeland or, um, yeah, not being in solitude, but being with others. Well, you know, I mean, the, the, um, the orthodox line is step number one, leave your, your family, leave your, your, um, your village, leave your area and go off and live up on the mountain. In fact, even in good old Tibet, very few people ever actually did that. Um, most they would do would be uh, to join the local monastery, usually in their area. Um, but I think that this is, is actually almost a drawback because in, in Buddhist Buddhism, always the lay people's main role is to support the monastics who are the professionals. And their, their role mostly has been that of cultivating generosity and ethics, maybe. Um, and I, I, nowadays, the most, I mean, in most audiences of Dharma audiences, both in the East and in the West, are lay people. Uh, the monastics are very little, less, and among those lay people, it's mostly women. And so you have, if you took the women away, the Lama would be sitting up on his throne in a practically empty hall. Um, and these women are not just devoted and sitting there, not understanding a word the Lama's saying, but having lots of devotion, as in a traditional form because the Lama would be speaking in high languages nobody understood. These are highly educated women, often professional women. I mean, yes, they have families, yes, they have responsibilities, but they are also very, very keen to be genuine Dharma practitioners. And so now we have to change the emphasis. I mean, sometimes, yes, you can go into retreat, leave your home, go and do a, you know, a short retreat somewhere, you breathe in, but you breathe out again. You're not always breathing in. You have to take what you've learned in your retreat and give it back to your, your family and your work colleagues and so forth. So the emphasis has changed a lot. I mean, now it's not just that lay people are there to support the monastics. They themselves want to study. They themselves want to practice. They themselves want to transform their mind. And this is the time for it, actually. Um, yeah, that's, I, I love that there are teachings both, which are very practical for where we are, but then also these teachings for the times of retreat and learning about the schedule at your monastery, the Donggyu Gatseo Ling Monastery, um, that when people first come, they have to spend a period of something at least like six years of serious study. Um, but then at that point, uh, there is an option, it sounds like, for some to go off and be become yoginis, actually people who would just give their life. Is that perpetual retreat? Could you say anything about, I mean, we'll come uh, come back around to uh, other practices, but what, what does life look like for someone who does fully give themselves to to practice in that way, in that form? Well, in our nunnery, of course, um, we don't have, you know, we're not up on a mountain. And so the retreat center, which is in two parts, but with a corridor uh, connecting them, um, they're just rooms around a central open courtyard with a shrine room. 
And so the nuns see each other. They don't see nuns outside. I go and see them every two weeks, but um, normally most people don't go unless there's, you know, there's some kind of repairs and the maintenance crew have to go in or something like that. But normally they don't see outside. And then they would stay in their own rooms and close the door so that nobody sees them. Um, some of the nuns are doing just a three-year retreat, but um, many of the nuns have taken um, a pledge for lifelong retreat. So that means basically that they stay inside. They come out every three years for a kind of break to see their friends and connect with their families, and they hang out for about a month, then they go back in. Um, and, you know, at a certain point, it, if they wanted to go outside, they, they could do so. I mean, if one takes the example of the Tokdens, the yogis in our monastery, who also are monks, even though they have dreadlocks and wear white skirts, um, after at a certain point, they are regarded as being um, genuine, realized top dense yogis. And so then if they want to go out, like they accompany the Lama come to Rinpoche on his tours, and when there are special rituals, you might see them come out. So the young ones stay inside, but the, the older, more mature ones can go around. And of course, they come to our nunnery to teach the nuns in retreat. I mean, our nuns in retreat are being taught by the yogis. So at a certain point, you're, you're given the opportunity to you know, participate more with, with other people. One of our yogis was always there. Anybody could go to see him any time you go because you just wanted to gossip about what's happening in the world or to ask him for prayers for a sick relative or to give you a, you know, a pointing out instruction on the nature of the mind. I mean, he was there for everybody, like somebody's favorite grandfather. So it doesn't mean that they're always forever going to stay enclosed. But I, I always say it's like if you have a cake, a mix, cake mixture, and you put it in the oven, and then that cake mixture very soon will rise. And then if we think, oh, look, it's cooked, and we take it out, inside it's not cooked. It's all gooey, and then it will just collapse and be disgusting, worse than before. But if we leave the cake in the hot oven until it's cooked all the way through, then when we take it out, it doesn't lose its shape, of course, and it's very nourishing and delicious. So that's the point, that they keep them in the retreat. Some of our nuns have been in retreat now nearly 15 years, and... Um, they will stay in there until the, their teachers, the Tokdens, decide they're fully cooked, however long that takes. Thank you, venerable. And uh, I love that analogy, and I'm not sure how cooked <laughs> I am yet. Um, I do, brown. I do. Brown. <laughs> At least on the outside. <laughs> yeah. um, and I uh, wanted to also ask, um, just... I think some of us hear about these retreats and yours or theirs, and I we just don't what you know in a Thai forest uh, narrative, one might say one enters, uh, kind of sinks into these or moves into these deeper states of concentration, then contemplates the body and let goes lets go of the khandas a, a bit or, or something like that. Can you? Give us a glimpse over of any kind into what someone's doing in that room. Like, what's the cooking process? What does that mean, uh, if we can ask? Uh, well, it's a little uh, complicated because, of course, they do many different practices at different times. But the main emphasis, once they, they get into real training, are what are called the, the six dharmas or six yogas of Naropa of which the most well-known is that of inner heat, um, where, you know, in the winter they dry wet sheets 
um, in Tibet especially. They, um, <laughs> you know, you see all the steam coming up from their sheets and how many sheets you, you dry um, within a certain amount of time. And there's a nunnery in Tibet where they're especially famous for their, their tumo. And um, it, it's still a very alive tradition. So anyway, but it's not intended for drying sheets. It's intended for opening up the central channels and all the chakras and um, creating great bliss, which is then united with the realization of emptiness and that is a powerful way of recognizing the nature of the mind. So yes, and also they do, of course, um, what is called Mahamudra meditation, which is, uh, again, for recognizing the nature of the mind and cultivating pure awareness. So the, the two, one is a very structured uh, practice in which you're visualizing yourself and uh, all the inner chakras and so forth. And the other is a very non-constructual, open awareness type meditation. So the two balance each other. Venerable, I, I had heard that um, it's been a while since I read Cave in the Snow, but um, I was just told recently that there was a period when you came out of one of your periods of retreat that um, someone was surprised that you were so able to just integrate back into society. It's like, <laughs> I know I've met people who've been on re retreat for periods of time, not as long as you, but um, who kind of, they kind of forget how to interact and their kind of social muscles have atrophied over the years of solitude. But, um, you know, how, how have you done this kind of to go from solitude to interaction and um, yeah, not have that be such a, uh, a sudden and uh, such a break um, of practice? You know, I mean, I think the point is that if one is just, you know, aware of whatever is happening at the time when it's happening, then when it, whether you're by yourself or with others, it doesn't matter because the awareness is just awareness. I mean, I, I think that the problem for many people when they're in retreat is that they get very focused on one, one point, right? And so then when you're outside and there are many, many things happening, many objects coming into your consciousness, instead of just that one object which you've been focusing on, then uh, people get, uh, it, it all kind of falls apart. Whereas if you have just open awareness, open clarity of whatever happens at the time to come into consciousness, just being aware of it, then it doesn't really make such a hiatus between being in silence and solitude and being uh, with others. I mean, because the awareness is the same. Does that make sense? Do you feel that even... Th that does make sense. Um, do you feel that your time in solitude, your time actually cultivating that and uh, immersing yourself in that, that form of awareness, this spacious awareness, when you're by yourself, that it actually did... Uh, help you when you came out and were in more of a more social roles did did you find that you had actually not just not atrophied your uh, social skills but were actually able to interact on a, a different maybe a different level of some sort yeah I mean it didn't seem to me to be that much different um, because as I say, if you are in a state of open awareness, then whatever appears is simply what is appearing at that point. So um, I didn't even think about it, you know. Uh, after I, I left uh, Lahu, oh, there you are, you're back. Um, uh, after I left Lahu, then I went on pilgrimage to South India. And uh, that was also very inspiring. And, um, but I, I wasn't really thinking about, oh, now, you know, I'm not in solitude anymore. Now I'm with, with all these people and all these, you know, thousands of crowds of people in temples down south. Um, it's just what is. 
I don't want to sound pretentious, but I mean, it's, you know, it, whatever it is, is what we are aware of at that particular point. So, you know, I didn't see it as being that different, really. Other people said, oh, you know, you, you know, it's so amazing, you're so um, sociable considering, but I don't know. It didn't seem to me that it w was that much of a difference. Thank you, Venerable. Um, I wanted to, in terms of looking at the changing of conditions and just uh, one thing, navigating one thing. them. Can I just say one thing? When you're in Please. a retreat, you're taking all sentient beings with you. So you're never really in isolation. First of all, you have all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. It got very crowded in the cave. You have all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas <laughs> of the universe. Then you have all sentient beings, likewise, who are practicing along with you. So it actually got quite crowded in there. And it wasn't <laughs> really that much difference when I came out and met the actual people that I'd been practicing with for so many years. Can, can you explain that? A venerable. What do you mean by the those in the K with you? How how are they in there with you during retreat? Well, first of all, the 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 feeling that even though one cannot see them, one is surrounded by very positive energy, which in the Mahayana is seen as Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Um, that that positive energy in the, from the universe is all around us, the Dharmakaya. And at the same time, when one is practicing, one is practicing on behalf of all the other sentient beings, so that one is like their, their uh, representative, right? They don't know how to do this practice, one is doing it on their behalf. So all these beings, not just human beings, but animals and insects and birds and fish and everything, are likewise imagined as practicing along with us. And so therefore, as I say, you know, sometimes it could get quite crowded in there. All sentient beings and all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, all of us, the cave becomes vast, right? We were glad we were there, for, there with you then, Venerable. <laughs> and uh, speaking about this way of thinking of the path and um, just such a, a vast, view and vision. I, I find as a growing up in a Western context, thinking about the, the broader storyline of rebirth. And I mean, I, I know I'm in Theravada robes this lifetime, but I don't know exactly what my path has been or, or where it will be going. And I know you've spoken, and I, I realize this is personal, and please don't feel obligated to delve deeper into it than you want to. But You've spoken about some determination to move through rebirths in a female body in order to, to move towards awakening in that form. And I, I'm just curious, how do you, what advice would you give to, to us who are new into this faith and into seeing the cave as filled and as our lifetime as part of a series, you know, how do we conceive of our path and 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 how do you conceive of of yours mm -hmm. say that the last bit again how do you how, how do we conceive of our of our path through lifetimes and how do you conceive of yours well you know of course in the ultimate nature of the mind there's no male or female we all know that our buddha nature has no gender obviously um but in the meantime on a relative level there has always been in Buddhism a big distinction between a male birth and a female birth. And uh, traditionally, most of the opportunities were given to the male birth and not much was given for the female. That's why I, I vowed to be, stay female because uh, you know we really need to equalize this a bit more and to prove that a female body is every bit as efficacious 
as the male body. There's no difference. The difference is in lack of opportunity for study and practice and support that the females, uh, even nuns have compared with monks, and even in the West, um, you know, where most of the sponsors are female women, they tend to donate more for the male authority figures than they do for the female. I mean, it's one of the ironies that the women do not like to support the monks more than they would support nuns, as you know, like Thailand. And so I thought, okay, then the only thing to do is not to pray to have a male rebirth, but to pray to continue to come back now in a female rebirth and to do what we can to raise the status for females so that you know they have equal opportunities, not that we're trying to take over from the males. So that would be just as bad, but that they all have equal rights and equal opportunities for practicing the path. That's the important thing. Otherwise, you know, for traditionally, it, there's been many difficulties and that's why they all pray to come back. Nowadays, I have actually known two Tibetan monks who told me that they were praying to come back in a female form because they wanted to join nunnery and they thought nunneries were nicer than the monasteries. Venerable, what, uh, in terms of that uh, trajectory, what, what is your feeling about the state of the bhikkhuni and bhikshuni sangha right now? How, and and what, what does the monastery look like where you are? Well, to my mind, it has been very interesting insofar as once the idea, traditionally, Tibetan nuns were not educated. And um, they didn't do, uh, they didn't study philosophy, they didn't debate, they were not teachers. And um, although they were very devoted, their opportunities for advanced practice was very limited. But nowadays that's all changed. And once the idea came that actually these women were really quite intelligent and definitely very diligent and focused, um, and the monks began to teach them philosophy and debating, then uh, everything changed. And the, the monks themselves have been incredibly kind and diligent in, in teaching the nuns and, and handing over everything what they can to the nuns. And everybody agreed this was a wonderful thing and that there's been now in the last 25, 30 years, a tremendous change. And now, of course, there are nuns who are Geshima in our nunnery. Very soon, four of our nun teachers will become Kenmo, which is the Kadyu equivalent of Geshima, and like professor. And they will be enthroned by our Lama Kamta Rinpoche. And so everybody's happy. Everybody rejoices, wonderful, very well trained nuns now, very diligent, very intelligent, becoming teachers. But when it comes to full ordination, the bhikshuni ordination, again, you hit a, a stone wall. And, and just recently, I was on a pilgrimage with 10 of our nuns and a group of American women uh, following the footsteps of Mahaprajapati Gautami, who, of course, was the Buddha's aunt and foster mother and the first Buddhist nun. And she traveled, she walked barefoot 400 kilometers from Kapilavastu to Vaishali, following the Buddha, with her 500 Shakya ladies. And the problem she had persuading the Buddha to ordain them and allow them to go forth from home to homelessness. And he kept saying no, as you know. Um, I mean, we don't know why he originally said no. Don't ask now, don't ask. My feeling is because at that time it was still very early years and the, uh, the monks were not living in monasteries or in settled places. They were sleeping under trees and just begging for alms. And while that was okay for the boys, it was not okay for women. It was, and the Buddha, how could he take responsibility for them? You know, they're 
you know, they could so easily be harmed, and sometimes they were. So I think that this was his hesitation. He couldn't take responsibility for all these ladies, most of them court ladies, right? They weren't just village girls, even. They were, you know, ladies who had lived a very pampered life, and now suddenly they were barefoot, wearing rag robes, and presumably going to be willing to live under, you know, out in the open, totally unprotected. So I think that this was his, his main, I mean, we don't know what his main objection was, but anyway, eventually, of course, he, he did give the ordination. But also, all through the years, there's been this resistance. When, in the eighth century, when um, uh, Padmasambhava and Shantarakshita in Tibet invited monks from India to come over to establish a monastic order. They didn't invite nuns, even though there were nuns in India still in those days, very much so, even in Nalanda University. But they're never mentioned, and they didn't invite the nuns. So the objection in Tibet is that there is no nuns lineage. It got cut off, and only a Buddha can be bring it back, so we have to wait for Maitreya Buddha to come. Uh, but the argument with that is that the Buddha said, first of all, that the, the lineage, the, the ordination lineage for monks and nuns is the same. It's Guru Chikpa. And that therefore, if there's a, a monk's lineage still going, then that can be transferred for the nuns. The nuns don't, it's not a separate lineage for them. And for example, if you're a monk and you become a female, you don't have to be reordained as a nun. You just have to move into a nunnery. Your, your ordination as a monk is valid also if you become a nun. And also the Buddha, as you know, said, Oh, monks, in the absence of fully ordained nuns, I allow you to ordain nuns. So this is what is happening now. I mean, they've been researching it and debating it for a year, for the last 30 years, and they still haven't come to any decision. But the head uh, lama of the monastic order in Bhutan, last year for the first time, ordained 142 nuns and gave them bhikshuni ordination. And he said, let's stop talking about it. All this just going round and round and round would do it. So, of course, Bhutan is, is, is um, a feudal kingdom with a great respect for their royal family. So when the king wrote a letter commending that this should happen, and then he came and gave an uplifting talk to the nuns and all the royal family, uh, then sadhu, 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 and the head of the, the head patron of the Bhutanese Nuns Association is the Queen Mother. So for them, it's, it's fairly easy. You know, they have the uh, commendation of the royal family plus the uh, monastic order, so the nuns feel safe and protected. But in, in Tibet and in, in exile here in India and Nepal, there's a lot of opposition against nuns taking full ordination. And so therefore the nuns feel, you know, they need to have the lamas giving their approval. And if the lamas say, oh, too many rules, how will you keep them all? And it's not necessary, you're educated now, why bother with all this other stuff? And then they say, oh, lasso, rinpoche, lasso, and they, and, you know, they don't, they don't stand up to recognize the benefits of taking full ordination. So, I mean, in all Buddhist countries, in the Theravadan countries, the same problem, that there's a lot of <coughs> opposition and criticism from the high ups. I mean, ordinary monks and maybe younger monks are, are open to the idea, but um, the, the, those in authority are terrified of losing even a, a small amount of their own authority. I don't know what they're afraid of. I mean, you know, fully ordained nuns only enhances the, the sangha. It's not like it, 
you know, they're taking over anything from the monks. The monks, even in Vinaya, are always going to be above the nuns. And, and you yourself, you uh, were ordained by um, the Karmapa, but then you actually went and got ordination in the Chinese lineage, is that correct? Yes, I mean, I first took my going forth ordination from my Lama Kamta Rinpoche, and then uh, a few years later, I went to Sikkim to get the novice Shramanayaka ordination from Kamapa. Then um, in 73, I went to Hong Kong and uh, okay. received the ordination there. Because, you know, it was obvious that Tibetans were never going to get themselves together. So in the meantime, I, when I took the Shramanayaka ordination for Kamapa, my only regret was that, that, you know, one was stopping halfway, you know, and how sad that one could not um, go beyond that. Yeah. In the Mahayana, of the, course, in, in, in Hong Kong and China and Vietnam, Korea, where they have always had, since early times, um, a big Shuni audience, uh, you can see that the nuns there have a sort of confidence. They're well educated, they're very confident, they, they start a lot of social projects, like they run state-of-the-art hospitals, universities, old age people's homes, orphanages. They're much more outgoing, much more engaged with society, as well as being Dharma teachers and uh, running retreat centers and so forth. So they're much more active. I think it, it can't be um, a coincidence that the, the output of the nuns is reflected by the level of their ordination. So the Tibetans are kind of halfway because at least they're novices. And then you go to the Theravada where they're not even novices. And therefore they, they really don't have much input into society in the way that they could. And should. Yeah. yeah, it's great that there are these different models. I mean, I hadn't visited your nunnery's website before, but the Dungyu Gatsal Ling nunnery website, it's quite beautiful. We'll put the link um, in the, the notes. Uh, but just reading about the life of the, the nuns there is impressive. One thing which you mentioned, which we really know nothing about, is actually the, the aspect of debate. That's something I wanted to to ask you about because I mean we're talking about the nature of mind and you know finding ways to just keep uh, nurturing and coming back to this this more spacious awareness uh, but for myself you know attending this Mahayana University that I'm at I'll say that you know it's the times when I'm in debate with you know Mahayana my fellow Mahayana students that I'm like least connected to any kind of more spacious awareness and <laughs> what what role does <laughs> what what role does a debate serve in in a spiritual life? How do you make that a spiritual vehicle? Um, it sounds like the nuns spend a lot of time doing that. Well, um, of course, we don't spend as much time as it as certain other traditions like Gelugpa, but they do do a couple of hours every day. It's um, a method of of learning and clearing our view based on how it used to be in uh, the big monastic colleges in India, like uh, Nalanda, Vikramashila, and so forth. Um, the idea is that you study uh, a certain you know, verses of a text, and then you go away and you debate them. Somebody um, puts a certain thesis to you, and you have to defend your own thesis. And this is a way of clarifying your views and seeing whether your views are in conformity with uh, what is established as being right view. And so it sharpens the mind. It makes the mind very sharp. I, I, I agree, it's not, probably not a time for practicing open awareness, but it is a time for being very, very clear and... Um, being very sure of what, what you're saying and how to defend what you're saying. So uh, they, they, they really enjoy it. I mean, traditionally, it was considered that nuns would not be able to do such a thing. You know, they couldn't study Madhyamika philosophy 
and so on, and logic, and uh, part uh, permitas and things like this, because their poor little brains would just boil over if they had to think too hard. <sighs> But uh, once they started uh, being allowed to study and were being taught, then people realized actually they're very, very bright. And also the idea that debate was too aggressive and you know, these sweet, gentle young girls, how could they possibly you know, be debating? They had no idea, no idea what women are really. <laughs> um, just recently, well, a year ago now, uh, 100 monks, came from our monastic college down the road. Our Lama lives in a, a monastery down the road and they have a large monastic college. And so a hundred monks came for the day to debate with the nuns. And Whoa. Basically the view? nuns won. <laughs> and um, wow. the, their, their teachers, including their male teachers, were so pleased because yeah, you know, and the monks were very good about it. Everybody was laughing and, in a, you know, it wasn't aggressive at all. But um, the, the nuns are bright, you know, and it, it sharpens your mind. It makes, you can't have woozy thinking, right? You have to be very clear exactly what you're, you're trying, the point you're trying to make and the point you're trying to defend or attack. And so it makes them, the uh, philosophical view very clear. And sometimes also different traditions debate each other because they sometimes have slightly different philosophical uh, view. And so they, they also debate each other. Um, it's not, you know, in any way kind of, as I say, it's, it's not aggressive, but it does make your, your ideas, you have to know what you're thinking and be able to defend it. So that was why it, it became very, I mean, Tibet's the only country, Buddhist country, which has maintained this ancient um, process. Uh, the reason for it, I think, is that in the old days, you know, these big monasteries were supported by the kings who allotted certain villages to, um, you know, uh, support the, these monasteries. So it's very important that you kept the king on your side. And the king, and at that time also in India, many, many different, you know, Hindu groups and other Jain groups and many other different, many, many, many different views. And so they would organize these public debates where, and at that, that time it was serious because who, whoever won got the support of the king. And if you lost, you lost the support of the king. So it was, in those days, quite serious. You, you really had to know how to debate properly and uphold your view. So from that, it was imported into Tibet and uh, has been maintained up to the present day. Thank you, Venerable. And speaking about this sort of more, I guess you could call it a, a left brain side of the tradition with debate. One really interesting counterpart, and perhaps it's not accurate to characterize it as a counterpart, but a really fascinating supplement is the focus in the tradition on the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, these, you know, variegated universe of Green Tara and the other Taras and Manjushri and basically all those companions you had with you in the cave. And I'm curious if you had, how should a Westerner, you know, just come to this realm, conceive of those? Um, are they uh, just incarnations of the Dharmakaya? Um, are these real beings? And is, you know, for example, does a mantra hold power in its form, in, in and of itself, or is it the intention that matters? Those are big questions for the two minutes which we have you for, but perhaps you could, perhaps you could take a, give it a try. Well, I mean, I think in the Mahayana, the, the, it came more and more obvious that the universe is alive and that this, this, Aliveness um, consists of, what can I say, 
of, of compassion and wisdom and uh, luminosity and at the same time emptiness. Emptiness in a sense you can't grasp it, you can't, you can't hold it and say it's mine. And so the, the, this, this, this enormous potentiality of the universe, the whole where we live is, is not empty in the sense of nothing is there but it, it's filled with intelligence. And so this intelligence was called then Buddhism Bodhisattvas. And as with, I mean, to my mind, it's a bit like a huge government office. You know, if you have a tax problem, you, you write to the tax department. You don't write to the prime minister. And so if you want to study and pass your exams, you supplicate Manjushri, who's the Bodhisattva of Wisdom. If you have a health problem, you you, you have a discussion with White Tara and, you know, and so forth. So there are many bodhisattvas and Buddhas who have specific roles to play. Of course, it's always many stories about how you're supplicating the wrong Buddha and it didn't matter anyway because they're all one in the Dharmakaya. It's only our mind which separates them into being different entities, of course. They are all reflections of our own innate Buddha nature. Um, our, our relative dualistic mind thinks outside, inside. Are they real? Are they not real? Um, somebody asked, uh, a Westerner, of course, asked a uh, Lama, okay, uh, if you tell me to practice Tara, then I will, Rinpoche, but answer me one question. Is Tara real? Does Tara really exist? And the Lama thought, and then he smiled and said, Tara knows she does not really exist. <laughs> it's a great answer. Yeah. Uh, Venerable, thank you so much for your for your time and your wisdom. One of the uh, insights in this eight verses for training the mind, which you also touch on in the in your recent book, the heroic heart, is whenever in the company of others, may I view myself as the lowest amongst all. And I just have to say that in your company, it's easy. Uh, <laughs> you're such a good teacher and a uh, yeah, really good, uh, fantastic example of certainly of. Uh, a monastic who's been in robes for longer than we've been alive and yet yeah, just as a, a sterling a sterling human <laughs> um, venerable just as a perhaps a final question um, how can if any of our community members would like to support you in uh, what you're doing there how can um, they contact or get in touch well we have a website we have two websites. One is tenzinpalmo.com and another one is dglnunnery.com. And people are, are very welcome to sponsor a nun. If they sponsor a nun, they will get a specific nun and a photo and she will send uh, a card at Losa, New Year. And uh, nuns are always very happy to hear from their sponsors. And it costs $1 per day. And will that be on, we'll put these websites in the show notes for everyone to tap into, but that is that just through the monastery website or Tibetan nuns project or? Through the DGL nunnery website, there's a donation uh, Great. where people can access all the, the different kinds of donations they can do. We'll, we'll put that and, um, Venerable, if uh, if you're near Seattle, please come and please come and visit Thank us. You. Um, Thank you. And uh, well, wonderful, I, I I rejoice to see you both. Thank you so much for inviting mm -hmm. me, and truly may may all your Dharma projects flourish, like the full glowing moon. Venerable, we're so grateful. Thank you so much, and. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.